right guys, I'm the Drink Pro. This Easter, we're doing a blind tasting with George T. Stagg. What can I get for you this Easter? George T. Stagg. Okay, but what year? What's up guys, it's the Drink Pro here yet again for another review. We've got a very special sample Sunday ahead of us, as you can tell. This is going to be a longer video than I typically make because I've got four different whiskeys I want to taste and talk about, and I've got some interesting history I want to discuss about George Stagg. So right over here you're going to see time codes that will let you jump to different parts of the video and get to the parts you really want to learn about. I hope you all are having a good Sunday. I know it's an important Sunday for a lot of people in the world, and this has been an important week for a lot of people too, with Passover and Easter coming very close to one another so I hope you're enjoying your holidays and today I've got a little bourbon holiday set up for myself what I've got in front of me is actually four different years of the George T Stagg bourbon I've got the 2014 the 2017 the 2018 and the 2019 big shout out to Scott Burkle for the 2018 and the 2017 samples and thanks Dan Kidd for trading me some samples so I can get that 2014 on my hands as well I also want to shout out Nate Cooper because Nate was the one who provided me the Thomas H handy sample I just recently tasted and I forgot to shout him out in the video don't want to forget my boy thanks Nate my girlfriend Yolanda poured these four different George T stags into these four different glasses so I don't know which is what it's gonna be an exciting time to try to figure out which one I like the best and see if I can guess which bourbon is which there are very slight differences which I'll get into in a minute between the four editions and that might help inform me in my decision-making process but we'll see how good my palate is <laughs> spoiler alert I don't think it's gonna be very good but we'll try it now George T stag bourbon is part of the Buffalo Trace antique collection I know so was the Thomas H handy and I've also done the Will William LaRue Weller from that collection. But this one has a certain acclaim in certain bourbon circles, particularly around where I'm living. I see a lot of people talk about George T. Stagg. For about 18 years now, George T. Stagg bourbon has been released on an annual basis by Buffalo Trace, excepting one year where they actually released three different editions. That year was 2005, where they actually released two different editions in the spring and then a second release in the fall. George T. Stagg is known for being big, bold, and powerful. Of the 20 different releases they've done of George T. Stagg, 10 of them have been hazmat, over 70% alcohol by volume. The highest proof George T. Stagg was actually in 2007 at a whopping 72.4% alcohol. That's hot. Now before I get into the details about each of these bourbons, I want to talk a little bit about George T. Stagg the person. Now George T. Stagg wasn't a distiller. He was a salesman and very good at what he did. George T. Stagg was born December 19th, 1835 in Kentucky and spent much of his youth in Kentucky. It wasn't until he moved to St. Louis where he became a whiskey salesman that he really started to get some connections in the business. One of the most important connections that George T. Stagg made in his lifetime was with this guy. Edmund Haynes Taylor. Now E.H. Taylor was actually a banker who had bought a small distillery in Leestown, Kentucky and turned it into the OFC distillery. That's a pretty popular acronym, Old Fire Copper, uh, very well known in whiskey circles. And by buying this distillery, he actually put in a lot of money and a lot of innovation to make the best product possible. At the time, the distillery was kind of using outdated technology and wasn't really on the forefront of making interesting products. But after E.H. Taylor went through the distillery and bought it out and renamed it the Old Fire Copper Distillery, it was a state-of-the-art facility. In matter of fact, there's some debate between who was the innovator who started the first climate-controlled warehouses for aging bourbon. Some say it was Colonel Taylor, and some say that it was George T. Stagg. Part of the difficulty there is that Colonel Taylor initially bought OFC, but eventually sold it to George T. Stagg. Now, George Stagg and Mr. Taylor actually had a little bit of a falling out. Uh, after he bought the distillery, George Stagg wanted to keep profiting on the name of E.H. Taylor, and there was a 12-year legal dispute about whether or not George Stagg could keep using the E.H. Taylor name. Eventually, he lost and renamed his distillery after himself, the Stagg Distillery. It was named the Stagg Distillery for almost 100 years before it was rebranded Granted, Buffalo Trace, a name we all know and love. There is a bit of a controversy about how George Stagg got a hold of the distillery as well. E.H. Taylor at certain points in his life definitely expressed not wanting to be in this business anymore, but it really looks like a financial panic that began in 1875 convinced Mr. Taylor to sell the distillery to Mr. Stagg, but let him continue using the name, at least temporarily, before there was this souring uh, between the two of them. So these two unlikely fellows, a salesman and a banker, actually came together to create one of the biggest empires in bourbon. 
And while George T. Stagg certainly did a lot of sales work and built up this distillery into the leading producer of bourbon at the time, maybe even today, I'm not certain about that, a lot of credit has to go back to E.H. Taylor because of all of the innovation he put into the distillery. He built the distillery and then it was marketed aggressively by Mr. Stagg. It actually kind of mimics the story of McDonald's if you're familiar with it, which makes George Stagg a bit of a controversial figure in my opinion. He had some things in his business practices that may be looked at as kind of shady, but he was such an effective marketer, an effective salesman that he got this whiskey out to the masses. Now, like I said, I'm not sure which whiskey is what in this lineup, but I do know what I have in the lineup, the 2014, the 17, the 18, and the 19, all the George T. Staggs. Now, there are some important differences between these whiskeys, so we'll start with the proof. The highest proof in the lineup is the 2014 whiskey at 69.05% alcohol. The next two are very, very close, the 2017 and the 2018. The 2017 is 64.6, and the 2018 is 62.45. Finally, and most controversially, the 2019 is our lowest proof whiskey. The 2019 George T. Stagg comes in at a paltry 58.45%. It's actually the first George T. Stagg release under 60% alcohol, and that caused a lot of controversy. This bottle was relatively cheap for me to get. Relatively cheap, I should say. Very important relatively there because people really didn't feel as as strongly about it there's a definitely a divide on the 2019 george t stag because it was so much lower proof and it had a different profile than historical pours the old george t stags were very powerful they packed a punch like i said half of them were hazmat additions so this whiskey coming in at 58 percent really disappointed a lot of people who had been following stag pours for a long time conversely a lot of people who are bourbon experts, who taste bourbon for a living, love the 2019 George T. Stagg. In fact, if you go looking for them uh, in a professional review capacities, you'll find several glowing reviews of the 2019 George T. Stagg. So there's a bit of a discrepancy between the fans and the pros. You see that in movies all the time. Well, this is a situation where you see it in bourbon. But like I've talked about in the past, the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection has stat sheets for each of their bourbons. And I looked at all the stat sheets for these four pours, and I've learned some interesting things. They're not that different between them. The 2019, 18, and 17 are all 15 years and three or four months. They're all within a month of each other. Now, the 2014 is actually a year older. It's 16 years and four months. Now, the 2019 George T. Stagg only pulled from the bottom four floors of five different warehouses, whereas the 2018 version pulled from the fifth floor, the 2017 version pulled from the sixth floor, and the 2014 version pulled from the seventh floor. What that really means for the whiskey pours is actually kind of already showing up in the proof levels. The lower warehouse levels are not going to be quite as hot. Temperature makes a real difference in the proof level of a whiskey coming out of a barrel. If the temperature doesn't get hot enough to evaporate the water and the alcohol, the proof won't raise. It might in fact lower from what it went into the barrel. You tend to see those proofs go up from higher floors and warehouses where it's going to be hotter. That also matters because you see a lot more evaporation. With the 19, 18, and 17 stags, they had about 50 to 60% loss in the barrels, which means if you put in 100 gallons, you were only getting between 50 and 40 back. Whereas the 2014 version had a whopping 75% approximately loss, which means if you put 100 gallons into those barrels, you were only getting 25 back. All right, guys, so now the moment you've all been waiting for. I'm done, John. I'm going to start drinking. And I'm going to start from my right to left, your left to right. Just go down the line. We'll smell all of them first. We'll taste all of them second. And then we'll try to make some conclusions about these pours. I brought my handy-dandy bourbon flavor wheel for this one because I want to make sure I really put some effort into thinking about the profile on these pours. They're very expensive pours. They're hard to find pours. And they're things that, you know, the generosity of my fans allowed me to come together and make this video. So I want to respect all of that. So let's go ahead and start nosing the first one of these. These have been sitting out for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so any of that initial heat from coming out of the bottle may have worn off. But I tell you, this has got a wonderful sweet cherry note right off the bat. I also get this really nice like candied pecan characteristic on the nose. Definitely you're going to have the vanilla, the sweet malt, lots of classic bourbon notes. But the amount of cherry coming out of this glass is really extraordinary. I'm also sort of getting a very soft butterscotch in this. The vanilla is very dominant, but there are other sweet notes that are subtle and behind it. A touch of honey, a touch of butterscotch, but they're very um, hidden compared to the, the vanilla. That's very prominent. That, that candied pecan is very prominent, and the cherry sweetness is very prominent. There's a hint of baking spice in this as well. I don't get much cinnamon, but I get sort of that 
uh, sharpness of like a clove. It's not so herbal as to be eucalyptus, but it's very subtle and soft. But I, I believe it's probably a clove note. Now, I will say also, I'm getting an interesting woody nuttiness out of this, but I think that some of that smell is what people will call tobacco. I think a lot of people would smell this and call it a tobacco note, but really what you're smelling in those instances is typically a sweetened tobacco. People are thinking about either a cigar that's got a Maduro wrapper and it's going to have a sweeter characteristic to it than a drier characteristic. They, they may even be thinking about pipe tobacco. I, particularly when I hear a pipe tobacco note, I kind of have alarm bells in my ears because... Pipe tobacco is often flavored in different ways, and the aromatic pipe tobaccos can really radically differ from the smell of just pure leaf tobacco. I'm not really getting any berries on this. The cherry note definitely stands out, but there's none of those other berries. And there's not really a, a fruity note either, except maybe a slight apple. No lemon zest, no citrus at all. I might actually get a slight rose petal. There's still very subtle herbal notes in this. Again, I get sort of a separation between the nutty woodiness and the herbal notes, but if you mash those together, it might read as tobacco leaf. All right, let's smell number two. Whoa, very different. Much more different than I expected, to be honest with you. I was kind of worried this was going to take a lot of picking through to find the differences in these. Oh, wow, it's a lot more, um, almost like a perfume. A lot brighter, sharper notes on this one. One thing that's worth noting is that these whiskeys have been opened different amounts of times. So that's certainly going to affect the flavor profiles. It's something that's impossible to adjust for, but you got to just do the best you can. Uh, if you're going to get a pour of a 2014 or a 2017 George C. Stag, it's unlikely it's going to be a brand new bottle. Yeah, this one is very perfume-like. It's fresh wildflowers, it's rose petals, it's very bright and flowery and very nice. There's definitely still a vanilla character in this, but it's a lot more subtle and a more waxy characteristic. And I think the sweetness here is a lot more like a white chocolate sweetness than it is a butterscotch or a honey or anything like that. There's also no woodiness on the nose of this at all. There's just zero wood I'm picking up on the nose. As I keep swirling this around and smelling this, I keep getting new notes. It's becoming sweeter and sweeter on the nose for me. That initial hit of floral is kind of dissipated almost entirely now. The vanilla sweetness is becoming more prominent. That white chocolate sweetness is still there. One thing that's interesting is, as floral as this is, there really isn't any herbal note. A lot of times the floral note and the herbal note will mix and mesh, but this is just very floral and sweet. If I really go hunting for fruit in this, I can get a little bit of orange and a little bit of raspberry, but it's very, very, very subtle. Number three, here we go. Now, number three is the woodiest of the bunch, and it's got the most baking spice of the bunch. There's a definite cinnamon quality. There's a definite dustiness to this. I'm getting a little bit of a green apple note on this. Ooh, a little bit of black pepper showed up. That's the first time that's made an appearance yet in this lineup. I also get a pine note out of this. As I keep smelling this, the cherry note comes out, but there's also a lot more of a sourness. The sourness appears more and more. It becomes like a sour cherry note on the nose. And the citrus comes out to play a lot more. I'm really getting that like orange flavor and it's not a orange zest. It's like a fruit orange. Yeah, fruitiness and sourness along with the woodiness. It's a very interesting dichotomy from some of these other pours. All right, last but not least, number four. Now, I will say this is the oiliest of the bunch, uh, just based on looking at it. And uh, it's got the least smell to it. Now, that could mean one of two things. That could mean it's the oldest one. It has been open the longest. It's lost the most uh, notes. But it could also mean it's the newest one and it's a low proof and it doesn't stand out and stand up to these other pores. Or it could mean nothing at all. Now as I get my nose down in there, I'm getting some of that cereal note, the malty sweetness. The vanilla candle note is back, that vanilla with the waxiness. Still getting a little bit of cherry. That's a very common note throughout these pores. But it doesn't stand out as much as it did in some of these others. This is the, the quietest cherry I've found. This one's very honey forward. The honey sweetness is prominent. Yeah, the sweet malty cereal is really prominent. This is very smalty sweet on the nose. There's no nuttiness in this. I'm not getting any nuttiness or any floralness in this at all. Of the four, I think this is the least complex one I've smelled thus far. A lot of rose petals showing up. It's very rose, but it doesn't have a lot of other floral components. I initially had no flowers at all, but now it's starting to come off as a rose with maybe like this slight citrus note. I'm getting kind of an apple note on this and also kind of a blackberry note on this. 
There's no sourness. Yeah, very quiet on the nose generally though. There's not a lot of baking spices. I've given you pretty much everything I can get out of it. Now let's go down the line and taste them and see if I feel differently about it. Wow, you can really taste the heat. Goodness gracious. Very hot. It stings, it burns your mouth, but it doesn't overpower you. It doesn't make me squint for very long. And my whole mouth gets coated in this woody, oh, woody, rich, bitter, tannic. Oh, wow, that's going to linger forever. Well, I'll tell you right now, I've had the 2019 and I've had the 2018. I don't think that's either of them. Uh, we'll see if I'm wrong or right, but I don't think that's either the 2019 or 18. It's got this interesting, lingering, bitter barrel note. It still kind of tastes like wood in my mouth. I haven't had another sip. I'm just going to do this live. I'm not going to cut this and just show you how long this lasts because it's kind of extraordinary. And I'm still getting this wood note. It really does taste like fresh wood. Like, like, well, not fresh wood. It's not freshly cut timber, but it's, it's, it tastes like the barrel stave. Like this whiskey soaked wood. I took a piece of it and just put it in my mouth like it was chewed. Just right there. It's still going. I'm losing patience with it. I'm going to try another sip, but I'm getting almost a nuttiness now on the finish, too. What a finish on this. And then going back to the nose afterwards, the woodiness shows up a bit more, but the sweetness is no longer nearly as cherry. It's a lot more honey sweetness on it. Yeah, this one is all wood. It's all that bitter, interesting barrel note. Really hot really woody. I'm trying to pick out other flavors in the beginning, but you get this initial honey sweetness and then maybe a hint of nuttiness and then it goes right into this wood pepper explosion that lasts forever. All right, let's try the next one. Now this was the herbal one and now I'm going back to smell it. I'm getting almost a creamy creme brulee. Once you taste something, it changes how you approach the other pours. That woodiness shows up, but it's a lot lighter. It's a lot more gentle. That one's got a slight sweetness that lingers a bit longer. It doesn't have you initial honey sweetness. There's definitely a mid-palate pepper note that comes up, whereas the first one is all barrel and wood. This one has a lot more pepper. That had a little pepper. This is a lot more pepper, and it tingles on my tongue for much longer. It's not bitter, but it's spicy. And going back to the nose on this, it kind of mellows out, honestly. It's not nearly as herbal. I get the honey notes show up. And honestly, I think I smell a bit more fruit in this now. There is a bit of an herbal quality on the mid palate in this. It has sort of an earthy, but not dirt, uh, a root kind of characteristic to it, like fresh cut herbs, but the herb flavors aren't really there. It's just vegetation. It's a reminder of herbs. And the mid palate is so peppery and interesting. It's all pepper and it lingers for a long time. It's quite sweet at the, initially, but the sweetness does not linger. Ooh, and then you get a nice Kentucky hug too. You can really feel it kind of travel with you. And that one sticks around for quite a while too. It's a different kind of sticking around though. It's not all woodiness. There's a hint of woodiness, but it's mostly pepper. All right, let's taste number three. Going back to the nose in number three, it's very sweet, very fruity. Here we go. Oh, this is very different from the other two. This is creamy, it's soft, it's vanilla. The mid palate is really gentle. Nope, hardly any pepper now. Lots of sweetness on the front. It's very vanilla, honey. Ooh, it kind of reminds me of like, um, it's almost like a cocktail already in a glass. It's got a little bit of the cherry note, a little bit of the bitter. It definitely still has that mid palate tongue dance pepperiness, but not nearly as strong as number two here. Uh, I should move this bottle so I don't get confused. It's not nearly as strong as number two here, that peppery dance in the mid palate and the finish, but it's definitely there. It shows up more in the finish. This one, it showed up in the mid palate. This one has more of a broad, this number three is a broad mid palate and the nose is just wonderful, creamy creme brulee. I love this. Oh, it's just honey and caramel and wonderful sweetness. I get a walnut, I get a cedar wood, I get the honey, I get this wonderful pepper tingle at the mid palate and finish. There's sort of this woody toasted note throughout my palate, this toasted oak characteristic. I think I like this one of the best of the three that I've tasted so far. That really is my personal favorite up to this point. All right, let's try number four. After all that prompting, the nose on number four is now smelling a lot more sour than it did before. 
I get a lot of sour cherry on it. All right, here we go. Whoa. Whoa. It's creamier than number three, which I didn't think was possible. Three was very creamy. Ooh, and then the heat. Wow. <laughs> wow. Number four brings a heat. My goodness. I think that's hotter than number three. It's not as woody, but it is hot and tingly and burny. Wow. Okay. The woodiness in number four starts right away. It's not overpowering like number one, but it starts right away. You don't even get sweetness first. You get woodiness, then you get a hint of sweetness. And it's an undefined sweetness. Boy, there's so much pepper. This is the pepperiest one in the mid palette. It's super hot. It's like slight woodiness, mostly pepper, a little bit of sweetness in the honey notes. Um, definitely this woody characteristic. I will say this is also the first one I get any minty qualities out of. This is a little bit of spearmint right away before it goes into the woodiness and all of the burniness. All right, I'm gonna add three drops of water to each one and do rapid fire tasting and see if that changes any of them. All right, here we go. More sour on the nose, way calmer on the palate. I like it better on the palate. The woodiness is definitely still there, but it's much sweeter and it has a longer beginning and mid palate. The nose is quieter on this. It's more herbal than I remember tasting it to be. Ooh, the peppery note becomes cinnamon. The mid palate becomes all cinnamon. I love that. All right. Not much change on number three, honestly. I get a lot of the, a lot of the wood, a lot of the pepper. Sweetness is still very subtle. Maybe slightly more like a candied cherry quality at the beginning of the flavor, but it's very much subtle change. It's the least change of the three. Number four. Number four, I think the wood actually shows up more. The pepperiness is definitely there. The heat's definitely there. Wow. <laughs> Very little change for three and four, but one and two changed a lot. Okay. Now it's time for the reveal and figure out what I got right, what I got wrong, what I like the most. It's honestly really tough to say which one I like the most. It's kind of like picking between your children. <laughs> I think number two, though, might be my favorite. The nose, I did not like the most. I liked the nose on number one, I think, the most. But the flavor on number one was far too woody for me. Uh, although with a bit of water, I think it opened up the best. I think a little bit of water, number one's the best, but um, without changing anything at all, the sweetness, the creaminess, the characteristics in number two are my favorite. That would be my go-to whiskey. And I'm gonna go ahead and assume that number two is the one that I own. Now, because it's so woody, I'm gonna say number one is the oldest one. That's what I had heard about the long forever finish on the old George C. Stagg. So the oldest one I'm gonna assume is right here. These two are a little trickier. I'm gonna assume number four is the higher proof of the other two. That would mean I'm saying number four is the 2017 and number three is the 2018. So I'm guessing 14, 19, 18, 17. And my personal preference order is number 19, number 18, number 14, number 17. Let's find out if I'm right. So I got them all wrong except for the oldest one, <laughs> which tells you something interesting. The 2014 really comes from a different era of these products. 2017, 18, and 19 were all really in the newest age of the George T. Stagg bourbons, where it was a much broader market, a lot more people were looking for them. And the proof has been dropped. You know, to some extent, there was a long period of time where every year the George T. Stagg was over 70. This is at 69% alcohol, so this really is coming out of the tail end of the 70 plus proof era. And these are all sort of in the same era. I'm really happy that the one I bought was my second favorite. That's a great thing to note. Uh, I really like that it was a creamier whiskey than some of these other ones. It had a lot more flavor evolution and interesting palate characteristics. The dancing on the tongue was a lot of fun. The George T. Stag from 2017 is my favorite. I'll have to keep my eye out for a bottle of that. I really enjoyed it. The 2014, I understand the appeal. It's unlike anything I've ever tasted. It had so much wood, so much lingering, and it was a wonderful experience, but the smell was so much better. I love the smell of the 2014. It was all this wonderful, rich fruit and I don't pick up any of that on the palate. It was really a shame, in my opinion. That's going to be a controversial opinion, I'm certain. 
but I definitely get why somebody would love this, but it's not for me. Thank you all so much for joining me. If you like this video, I've got tons more content coming out soon. The Patreon is always available. You can become a member of my Society of Drinking Professionals. Lots of different levels to join. It's as cheap as $3 a month. You can buy me a drink, a cheap drink, and have access to the group of people that are really serious about this. I always post new special content up there that's only available on Patreon. I'd love to have you be a part of the team, guys. Please consider subscribing. Please consider sharing this video with your friends. I hope you all have a great holiday season. Thank you all so much for joining me. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy your Sunday and keep drinking like professionals. Cheers.